we're going to pause here because sure. I'm not editing these videos. How great is it that the people creating the podcast doesn't have to edit the video? <laughs> it's, 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 I swear to God, it's the great, it's the only reason why I agreed to do this. Son of a bitch. Everybody, welcome to this month's ish edition of Nerd Enthusiast uh, Movie Podcast. We're going to do a little bit something different here. It's, it's not a movie review. We're going to do an interview. Um, uh, first of all, we're going to get some housekeeping out of the way. Make sure you like and subscribe to all of the social medias. We have the Facebook and the IG, Twitter, and the TikTok uh, for Nerd Enthusiast. Also, check out nerdthusiast.com. That's big for us because people put new posts and everything like that. It's, it's, it's really fun. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk to Cameron Mitchell. Cameron Mitchell is, uh, uh, quite frankly, a working member of the movie making society. You know what I mean? It seems like that is, you know, it's, this is kind of how he makes his living, which is uh, really fun and sh probably stressful. Say hi, Cameron. How you doing? Hey, yeah, definitely. Thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, props to you and Anthony and everybody at Nerd Enthusiast uh, for you know looking into this stuff and the real perspectives. You know, because I think we need more of it. You know, because mm -hmm. uh, the content we watch, I, I think we're becoming more aware of the content we watch and what goes into that. Um, so really cool to be on a a film enthusiast podcast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, all right. So let's, let's kind of start a little bit from the beginning, if you don't mind. You're, you're from Michigan, all right? Yeah, originally uh, from Marquette, Michigan. I am the son of two documentary filmmakers, uh, uh, David Mitchell and Sharon Snyder. And growing up in Michigan, you know, it, 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 more so time was spent around the world, really, than in Michigan, because they would take me with them when they would go to Germany and film their films. Uh, they'd take me to California and Florida and all of these uh, places where they were documenting the disability rights movement. Um, so I got kind of exposed from an early age, I guess you could say, um, and then didn't really think about it. You know, it was kind of just like the air I breathed, you know, uh, but then got to college and Temple University and I uh, kind of accidentally took a course on visual anthropology. And the professor of that course wrote me into a study abroad program in India that summer. And I made my uh, first college level documentary. Um, and then when I came back, I, you know, realized it was like a rock hit me on the head, like, oh, duh, you know, you love film. It's been around you your whole life. Uh, you might as well pursue it. So I switched my degree from a psychology major to a film major, kept that visual anthropology major in there too, and, uh, you know, started making films in the mm -hmm. Philadelphia area. Very cool. I'm, I'm convinced that anybody that goes to college never ends up in film. They just switch to it. You know, it's just kind of what happens. How was Temple? I mean, I know Temple as far as I know. It's it's the it's the college. It's a big college in Philadelphia. If people don't know what Temple is, but it's a it's a it's a pretty big shot college actually. How was Temple? Oh, yeah, I mean, cool to hear it referred to as a big shot college. I think uh, <laughs> you know, uh, depends on the program, right? Um, but right. There, it's like you know, if you're local to Philly, you know about Temple. If you're local to the tri-state area, you know about Temple, I feel like. The experience at Temple was great. I owe a lot of, you know, just my nascent, like early networking to going to Temple and being in the film program and, you know, DPing films for other students, uh, grad theses, things like that. So, you know, Temple was hugely supportive in starting my career. It even ended, they even ended up getting me to, into this thing called a tripod program where I ended up directing a documentary about the Philadelphia film office. Um, so, you know, just opportunities abound there and I highly recommend it to anybody considering it as a film school for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, so my, my film, uh, just, just to kind of give you a bit of a, of a comparison, my film school experience is the New York film Academy. So uh, it's, which is for nice. lack of a better term, a, a, a 
uh, like an advanced film camp. You know what I mean? It, it, one of the things that I, I really enjoyed about it is the concept that when you go there, you cycle through jobs, like director becomes a job. You know what I mean? Um, uh, DP becomes a job. Uh, you know, you know, you know, first camera becomes a job. Like is, is what was it like going to film school at Temple? I mean, was there a structure? Did everybody have a role or, 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 you know, what was it? I'm, there was probably things like, you know, screenwriting classes and stuff. That's pretty typical. But as far as the actual doing the job, how did they teach you how to do the job? Right. That's a good question. I mean, um, you know, a lot of it can fall into like the technical school area, right? If you're, because mm. a lot of uh, film industry is, are different crafts, you know? So like if you're yeah. in electrical department, you might have an engineering background. You might not also, uh, you know, Harry Box, the author of the set lighting technician's manual says that you have enough knowledge to be dangerous. Uh, as an electrician. Um, but, you know, it, it's kind of like all of these loose and fast categories, but also deep, deep amounts of experience over time, right? The more film sets you work on, the more knowledge you gain. And really, you know, after uh, being, for me, being in the, the industry for over a decade, I still feel like every day I'm learning something new. It's just, it goes on and on forever. In terms of what my experience at Temple was like, I'd say probably one of the, the biggest influencers for me was taking a moving camera class with Michael Kudemeyer. Um, Steadicam and, you know, Jib and uh, Dolly, a lot of camera moves are cov covered in that course. Uh, and it probably had a hand in the direction I took uh, coming out of college as well. Um, cause it got me in a steady cam pilot, which is a very entry level steady cam. And once I was in, I was kind of hooked, you know, I also moving camera has always kind of been an interest and a, a specialty of mine. So having that one-to-one -one connection with the camera and being able to mm -hmm. move it in a, a variety of different ways, you know, really, you know, kind of just spoke to me. And so um, I ended up, you know, getting a steady cam a few years after college. It took me a while. They're expensive. Let's yes, they are. I know. You know, about, <laughs> you know the, yeah, the the bourgeoisie uh, <laughs> element of the film yeah. industry. It's absolutely there. Um, yeah, I hear you. And, you know, and it's a reason why, like one of my friends, uh, Roy Wagner, who's an ASC GP, he pushes or he not pushes, he supports. Uh, black magic cameras because he doesn't believe that you should have to choose between a house or getting married and you know buying your first cinema camera right uh, right 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 and so you know that's a whole other conversation but yeah <laughs> temple temple is a great place to go to fil uh, film school because it, they're very it's very like what you are what you make yourself and that's exactly kind of what the film industry is like it you know it's not you're not going to get handouts you have to yeah. you know really hustle for your next job make sure people know your name what you do specifically so and that you're top of mind um you know for referrals and for the next you know whether you want to get on a feature or a TV show or a documentary, like, you know, you're top of mind for that job. So Temple definitely helps you prepare for that, you know, and, and then some, the, the structure of the curriculum is very much like you choose what you take. I know some people think that Temple's an auteur program, like it pumps out director auteurs. Tim and Eric Heidecker are from Temple. Yeah, um, people kind of know that one. <laughs> right. You know, like various, you know, uh, very different uh, filmmakers, you know, I think it is what you make it. So like, it doesn't have to be an auteur program. If you're not like an auteur director or whatever, you know, you can take screenwriting, you can take moving camera, you can take master cinematography one and two, as far as like finding your role, it, it, it you know, it literally is just you know, do different things and what speaks to you. And then you start doing that on other people's films and very much like in the industry, you know, it's like tell, uh, you know, but at the, at the same time, it's also like, uh, uh, I need a couple of grips and I can't find anyone. And then you might have to like right. jump in, you end up doing something that you haven't done before. And I, but I think that's good exposure, you know, cause I've probably done 
almost literally every position on a film set from production assistant to best boy electric, uh, best boy grip, uh, key grip, gaffer, uh, you know, uh, steady cam, um, techno crane operator. So, you know, uh, that's, that's, that, that's just my path, I guess, and what I've ended up doing, but I also recommend it. You don't, you shouldn't be afraid to go into any department, you know, keep, keep an open mind in the beginning. Right. Yeah, that's, when you're yeah, that's actually something that I've kind of noticed, especially in, um, you know, recent years, past, past 10 years or 15 years, everybody, the, the, the people that do work, you can't be afraid of, you know, just, just kind of jumping into a role. You know what I mean? It's, it's, I mean, just again, going based on things like your IMDb, but also having shot things. I, I kind of understand like, you know, there's uh, holding a boom pole is as important as the guy in the steady cam. And, 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 you know, you, you, you have to, you have to, um, you know, the, the wide arguably, range of knowledge arguably is what more people important. want. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, 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 exactly. Good steady cam if move. anybody knows anything about, if anything knows anything about, small independent production it's cool to get all the cool shots in the world but it, but if your audio sounds like shit doesn't mean anything <laughs> you're not getting anywhere if your audio is bad <laughs> absolutely so you know it's 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 sort of like the the people that have been coming up in the last however many years probably at least a decade if not two decades um since the advent of digital has uh, everybody knows how to do everything and if you can't you're kind of missing, you know, um, the point, kind of, you know what I mean? Like, you know, if, if you, you know, you, you, you have to be able to pull focus as much as you can run a steady cam, which are two completely different things. That's kind of a controversial take. To Is it some, really? Yeah, because uh, there are operators who have never done anything else. You know, there are. I hear you. I hear you. Know. But I mean, to me, just, just kind of understanding the, the and again, you know, you've worked on some big shit. You know what I mean? You know, you've worked on things like Mary V. Swick and, and, and Iron Fist and stuff like that. And so you've seen the, and, and uh, Molly's game, which I do like. What's that? Yeah, I, uh, it sounded like you said East Wick. Uh, oh, did East I say East Wick? Oh, East Bear, excuse me. Be honest. <laughs> For some reason, every time I, I, see the, I see the name Mayor of East, uh, <laughs> help me out. Wait, wait, wait. Eastwood. Eastwood. I always think of witches of Eastwick for some stupid ah. reason. <laughs> but I mean, I don't. I like. I mean, to me, it's sort of like whenever I whenever I think of like of of the of the job of everybody on a set, I I feel like that people need to be able to do more than one thing. You know what or I mean? Understand what the other departments do. Yeah, because, yeah. You know, you know. When you get when you get on set, you got to know how to work the structure of it. Right. You know, um, if you want to be as helpful as you can to your department, you got to know what the other departments do. Where you go to yeah. ask for gaff tape, or when you need an extra line of, for for juice, you know, to to charge camera batteries. You know, like those are all places where the departments intersect and. Mm -hmm. If you're on a union set, guess what? You can't, if you don't know who owns that, the, you know, the extra putt putt Jenny, uh, right. you can't grab it yourself. You can't even pick things up. You'll, you'll get fired. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, you know, I definitely, yeah, you definitely, I, you know, I, I definitely recommend just a, a, like a well-rounded, at least know where to go and what the positions are and who to ask for what you know, um, cause it will, it will make you that much better on set in whatever department or position you're in. All right. So let me, ask, so, so are you, are you looking for proper jobs while you're in college? You know what I mean? Are you, are you looking to get into a union while you're in college? Are you looking, are, are you applying to places while you're in college? Are you, you know, or is it, after i think it's during the for sure you know you can't get too involved because obviously you still have a course load so i wouldn't recommend joining the union uh unless you were like graduating in a semester or something and you knew enough people in the union that you know 
you, they, you'd be able to get jobs because that's the catch 22 of being in the union is you have to have a network of people that you know that are going to get you hired. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to end up paying quarterly dues and, you know, not seeing any not work, doing for, work. Right. Which is, which is fine for a period of time, but especially now during, you know, the pandemic, uh, I wouldn't recommend just joining with no contacts. I think that's a more prescient point than ever. You need to make sure that you can get those types of jobs before joining other, you know, otherwise it's going to be a lot to handle. Yeah. And, and, you know, in college, yeah, it's, if the college is a good college, you're also just going to be doing projects, right? And the projects kind of build out that networking, you know, depending on your path, right? Because for me, like, I'm, you know, I'm one of those, guess what? I want to be a director, you, you know, type people. Uh, right, sure. Joke is that everyone and their mother wants to be a, a director. There's a difference though between somebody who is like, I want to be a director and somebody who actually is. And I think that right. that difference you know, and I learned, had to learn this the hard way is that you act, you have to take and do directing jobs in order to follow that path. And so if, you know, you're just getting into film and you're, you're like, oh, you know, I just, uh, I don't want to direct, but I like being a part of movies, then, you know, find your niche. But mm -hmm. if your, your end desire really is the direct, then you got to get out there and direct, whether it's spec commercials that you make yourself you know, for brands that you might want to shoot something for, or mm -hmm. if it's a short or it's short films that are in the vein of your style and voice, all of that is very much in line with, you know, that, that path. And I think for me, I, I wanted to observe everything. I wanted to, to, to learn as much as I could. I was a bit of a perfectionist about not wanting to do a feature film myself until I was like, you know, absolutely ready. And I yeah. think it was overkill you know, as an approach, uh, because yeah. you'll notice a lot of directors don't have that experience and they rely on, or, and, or they should at least rely on their crew to help them, you know? And I think, you know, this has been in the media a lot recently uh, with, you know, what the horrible outcome of Rust and Helena Hutchins, the DP uh, yeah. dying, is that there was a breakdown in the chain of command and, you know, uh, production. I mean, more details will come out and, you know, I'm, uh, I don't think that we should speculate before we truly know. Right. Yeah. But I, but just speaking more generally, I think that's, you know, the, the industry changes more than people think it does. When I joined the union in 2017, there was still a, a digital utility position that was being phased out of camera that doesn't exist anymore. And now loaders are media managers. The DIT used to manage media. The DIT no longer does that. Things change uh, in our the rapidly. Changing. So I'm just curious then, just what's a digital utility uh, as opposed to a loader? Digital utility was more like, I think like a, uh, a versatile helping hand you would see in the quarter a digital utility on on a stage show might be you know uh, helping with cable runs you know bouncing between various cameras things like that a loader and additional loader now are much more specific jobs and i think that is a good byproduct of our union is that they fight for specificity because mm -hmm. that's that's an easy trap to fall into on a set is just asking whoever to do whatever, even if it's not their department. And then we end up with overworked and uh, underrested, uh, you know, crew members uh, who do too much and are trying to, you know, please the higher ups, so to speak, and satiate power relationships that are really just being abused. So a loader now specifically has duties to the the main unit loader manages the media for all of the the, the main cameras um, mm -hmm. so they are in charge of reloads they have to know how many card there's a card count of how many cards are on set uh, they're in charge of the download so they'll use a, a, a software like silverlight or um, shot put pro uh, check some software to ensure that media is you know downloaded transferred uh, and verified. On top of that, if you're an additional loader, you're running batteries, you're checking to make sure that things are charged and nothing is going to go down uh, while, while it's being used. And 
Uh, also, you're managing the wireless video system on set and you're helping the main unit loader set that up every time you have a location move. Those are the main duties of a loader and it is not coffee runs. <laughs> <laughs> right, but, <I> <laughs> but uh but some but some productions still run like that and if you're an additional right. loader you might be doing a coffee run i feel bad for pas because i really think the like production assistants need a union they need to be unionized right, i know what you mean only departments <laughs> that aren't unionized because you know it's it's all it's all work you know and, and, it, and it all needs to go somewhere and the only time you get specific with it is really it seems like when there's a union involved because you need you know, an organization that holds the line, you know, because the PGA is such a massive and powerful force, the Producers Guild, um, that, you know, that, that's why these bargaining agreements matter. But yeah, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. All right. So let's, um, let's kind of talk a little bit about a couple of things that you have done. When I was talking to Scali a little bit, he was like, you know, he's working on things like Iron Fist and stuff like that, uh, which I, I, I don't know how much of that is just another job. You know what I mean? I, I'd, you know, compared to, any of the other stuff that you do to kind of um, not to diminish things, but, you know, just to pay the bills, you know what I mean? Cause you have to work, you know? Um, but well, I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's all career advancement, right? So yeah, I wouldn't say it's just the job. I was the crash camera manager on that, which was a lot of fun. I had got to manage like you know, five, five different Sony a seven S's and crash cages. And we got to like blow them up and like knock them around and stuff, which was a lot of fun. Uh, now, I mean, I'm a, I'm a, just like a lot of people, I'm a, I'm a camera nut. You know, I mean, I mean, I mean, that's what they're using are A7S's, you know what I mean? Stuff like that. A7S, you know I, mean? I think at that time it was the A7S2 because right. uh, that was when that show was shooting. But just the DP, Neil liked them because of low light sensitivity. And right. so you can blow one up and it wouldn't be too much of an R&D, uh, like an R&D report where you replace it and have to pay a lot of money out of pocket for it. Right. Two or three grand for a camera as opposed to twenty thousand dollars oh, for an Ari. Right. Well, we were shoot that show was shot on red weapons. Um, so yeah, you know, like twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars, depending on the number of accessories that are on it. All right. So all right, so here's a here's an important question, actually, that I think a lot of people have. Where do you actually get your jobs? How do you know where you're gonna be working the next day? Is it something as as simple as going up on something like mandy.com and getting a freelance thing or is it or is it um i mean do you have an agent do you have somebody that tells you where you're going to be at any one time you know what i mean you've gotten to a little bit of a level where you've you've graduated college and you've done work that people have seen you know what i mean so you've kind of gone to a point where i don't know if necessarily you're scrounging for the next job to do anything but um you know, is there, is there, you know, I mean, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you fill up your day with a uh, livable wage job? You know what I mean? That's, 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 you know, something I'm interested in. Yeah. I Not mean, personally, because I have a job that pays well, but it's just, you know, right. it's, you know. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. For me, I just joined the Reddit anti work subreddit. I don't know. If you've heard <laughs> right. <of it. laughs> Uh, <laughs> so, so uh, that, I think that in a nutshell, <laughs> right? That in a nutshell kind of sums up what what I'm about, which is I don't, you know, I want time. I want time to write right now. For instance, I'm I'm writing a feature, um, you know, and I'm on page thirty right now. And if I were to take a feature job, it would totally kill my momentum because features and TV shows are, you know, sixteen hour days. You have no energy after doing one of those uh, to to do other things. Now, the the there's so there's pros and cons, right? Pros are that if you do commercial work and you know day play, the rates are great uh, for steady cam operators, for cinematographers, for directors, uh, for gaffers, and so I think you know part of why I became a DP first was economical. It was a, a financial decision because you can't, you know, you, well, you, I think when you're a PA or when you're a grip or, a, you know, an electric in, an, in the indie world, you have to constantly work because the rates aren't nearly as high as they should be, right? right. 
So, but, you know, even joining the union doesn't solve that. Like there are, we still have uh, like a new media contract where a steady cam operator can pay, get paid 300 a day to steady cam. And that's just, you know, for what, and then we call it working for scale, right? And nobody really should work for scale even, you know, it's, you are your own entrepreneur. You man, it's like owning your own business. So your clients or whatever you, you want your clients to be, what type of work do you want? And then look into that area. I think the process is actually similar. Say if you, you're uh, a corporate, you're into corporate stuff. You want to make, you want to work on jobs that are, are corporate. You know, you want to operate for, you know, uh, business meetings and things like that and whatever corporate people do. I'm not a huge corporate person. You, you got to go out there and you got to put things in your reel that will, you know, show that you can perform the job, right? Right. I know um, you mean. And also like in your resume too, you want those highlights in your resume to be like, if this is the type of work you want, I have separate resumes for, you know, each position that I am interested in performing that I currently curate and upkeep. Um, Cause I don't ever want to just send a resume that has all of my credits on it. I want it to be tailored to the job because every job that you go out and get, you have to convince them basically that you are the most specified and skilled person for this job. And that, you know, so I think that necessitates the having individual resumes. Yeah, if you want to work in TV, TV is a little trickier and it's definitely more of a work your way up type thing. But you could also break in if you befriend a, a, the right producer and they walk you onto a show. You know, you could, they, you know, you, you can become unionized if a producer writes a letter to the union and says, hey, uh, you should just walk this person in. You could also unionize if a, a show flips. Um, so if there's enough people that are union and then they want to take an indie show union, they'll come in. That, that's more rare. But when the show flips, if you're non-union, you will then become union. So that's a little more complicated. But the, the less complicated side of it is uh, shoot pilots. You know, uh, if you want to, if you want right. to work on TV, DP, uh, uh, webisode pilots, um, webisode series, and uh, if somebody likes it and somebody likes the style and the work, um, you can then use that, you know, as, as a sample uh, when you apply to a job like that. All right. So now here's, here's, a, here's a question for you. So pilots, pilot, shooting pilots seems like if, you, if your job, if the way that you make money isn't through video production, seems like the most fun way. To, to do anything. Uh, I mean, uh, how do you get involved in, in pilots? I mean, are they? It, it's, I, I mean, mean, on the indie level, it's literally yeah. just, um, you know, finding- Just get some money together and then shoot? Is that is that what it well, is? It depends. I mean, Again, this depends if you're the director, producer in this case, or are you the crew member? You know, like, hmm. but it's funny because like for me, I, I'm both, so- when I wasn't getting, you know, I wanted more work, uh, DPing, you know, narrative work. And so I wrote and shot my own short film, um, you know, but like not everybody wants to do that or can do that. Um, so, but regardless, I think it doesn't, you still end up in a, you want a scenario where you have a group of people who are all enthusiastic about whatever the project is and then you need a, a, a director, somebody who's the most enthusiastic about this project, right? That they're not going to leave the project. They're going to see it through to the end because it's their child, you know? And I think that's a, a, a thing I see a lot of directors struggle with is that the they think that because other uh, positions aren't holding the enthusiasm, like in yeah. post-production, for instance, I know that, that the, project, the project is losing steam. And then they kind of just let it fall apart. But what they need to realize is that there's only really one person in the room that ever sees a project get to end, and that's the director. Um, so that's you know that's something that's not talked about enough. It's 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 a very hard reality of the position. So if you want to if you want to direct, I'd say that's the most important thing is that you have to love the idea. Of, of whatever you're doing, you have to, to love that project enough so that you won't abandon it mm. ultimately in the end um, and, and or let it fall apart.
because there's only there really is only one person in the room that has that enthusiasm to finish it and that's the director the director everybody knows is is not just captain of the ship but i also i i always learned that director was kind of a job you know what i mean in the sense that the the director is very much simply the fact that they're in charge of people and in charge of the direction of something doesn't necessarily make them better or worse than the guy running the camera or the producer or the it's 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 just simply a position to fulfill what you're talking about is more so the i mean i mean do you find that especially in the indie world do is it is it is it a lot of director producer is is the director always a producer in that case no um i think the smarter ones are getting producers <laughs> Right. <laughs> uh, I, I, yeah, I did it myself and I, 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 I don't know. It's like, it's whatever you can do, you know, cause it's like, we speak as if like, you know, oh, everyone has an iPhone. And so, you, you know, you can make a film. That's, that's not true. It's complete yeah, right, bullshit. I know. Um, it so it's, it's all about working to your circumstance. Um, for instance, with uh, my short film, The Co-op, um, which, you know, got in the slam dance and over 20 festivals internationally, it was, it was started, I wrote it for a diner. And the night before I, I secured that location. And by the way, I, 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 I set this up around an, a film challenge. And that's another thing I would have, you know, strongly consider filmmakers consider our film challenges, because when you're first starting out, you don't have the money, right? You don't have the financing capital. You don't even have anyone that wants to take a chance on you because you've never made anything, right? right. Um, so film challenges are a good way that it's, it sets the terms up front. Everybody knows that they're in the room just to make something uh, hopefully good. Um, and, you know, you can pu pull all your favors basically. And favors have monetary value too, by the way. That's, a, I, think, I feel like an important thing that's not talked about enough. So like this location I secured, the diner, right? That was a favor. They weren't going to charge me anything for that. Now, the night before they called me and revoked the location. Uh, so it turned from a, a favor into a huge pain in my side. I scrambled and through my wife's sister, who worked at a local co-op grocery store. We I were was going to say it's a grocery store. Minute, pull together a grocery store location. And the value of that location, we got to shoot there two nights of the weekend, is probably in the thousands of dollars, you know? Yeah. Um, so, you know, when you talk about bringing money into a project, I, I think it's not considered enough that in-kind favors are money. How, however you've built your life, your connections, like what circles you're in, I think those are all circumstance, right? Circumstances you should consider uh, for your first films because you're kind of working against the grain here to make something, right? And so uh, if you build that house with cards you already have, you know, um, it's, it, you, you have the materials at least to, to some regard. You're not reinventing the wheel. Sort of like write what you know, in a sense. You know what I mean? Like, you know, if, you know, you look around and see what you have available. Yeah. I mean, definitely. It's definitely like, right. What, you know, it's also, yeah, because it goes back into who we are as people, right. Cause when you're a filmmaker, inherently some of your life is going to be reflected in your work, whether you like it or not, whether you're aware of it or not. Um, so do you believe that? Do you believe yeah, that absolutely. really? Do you, do, oh, yeah. do, do you really? I mean, I, 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 really, I, I've, I've, I know that a lot of people kind of kind of do that. They they sort of create art based on what they're what they've experienced and and what they know. To me, it it almost seems like a challenge to create something based on not knowing anything. You know what I mean? Learning about something, creating something. You know what I mean? Sort of like sure, but you're um, still making decisions. You know, um, yeah. Those decisions yeah. are you make decisions based on your experience with decision making, you know, like your taste, right, 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 right. what you like and dislike. An example I've been on a kick using recently, my one of my English professors from Temple, actually, Andrew Irvin, he tweeted that, um, has anyone ever, can we talk about the the scouring of the Shire? And he was referring to the Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yeah. And uh, so it turns out that Peter Jackson completely eliminates this like the the key ending of Tolkien's books, uh, that the Shire was actually scoured and almost destroyed, and you only see that in a mirror in the Lord of the Rings, right? As a potential, you know, future. But 
for Tolkien, who wasn't a fan of allegory, it was one of the only allegories he ever wrote, which is basically that Saruman starts uh, siphoning hobbit weed from the Shire by buy like, buying it through Lotho Baggins. That's how Mary and, uh, ends up, the, the two brothers end up smoking it near Saruman because they find they, and Is, uh, Isengard. And Isengard. They find the stock of hobbit weed in Isengard, but it's played as a joke in the movie. You know, it's uh, whereas in the books, it's like this huge implication of industrialization and how, you know, the English countryside is kind of under threat from that, that globe, like that industrialization. So anyways, that's my Lord of the Rings uh, track, <laughs> but just showing you how decisions that are made, right? Peter Jackson made that decision among with many others. And I think a lot of people who watch and are fans of the series will then say, yeah, the extended cuts aren't any good, you know, and that the things that were cut out were like the right decision to cut out. But, you know, I think that's- I think they're out of their mind. I think they're <laughs> way better, I think they're way better movies. You give me four hours of one, one movie of Lord of the Rings, other than The Hobbit, because they suck. But they were, <laughs> they, I, I, I'd, I'd watch the whole thing. I, I think it's great. Sure. But yeah, so the basic point being that we make decisions, uh, you know, like it or not, the director, you know, you said the director is just a job like any other, but in some ways it is like the, depending on who's in charge, right? Because also producers can now fill this role. Unfortunately, we have eight, nine, 10 producers on set that are all story producers or whatever. You know, the director is supposed to be the one who makes these tough decisions, right? And so, you know, it just depends on like what type of content you like, what, what, what's your style? I think for a lot of people, it's Marvel movies, you know, like obviously a lot of people like the style of the, the Marvel film that's been created. And yet it's so, there's so many different directors uh, involved in those movies. And so what I've found or heard and found is that a lot of it comes from the top down and you'll get storyboards and it will be storyboarded out for you. And the director might not even have a say sometimes in what those storyboards look like. Independent creative choice is an important thing. That, right. Know. So, you know, I, yeah, I would say like, yeah, like it or not, you're in your work, um, whether you know it or not, whether you're, you're, you know, actively acknowledging it and writing about it, or if it's just something that you choose to let go on in the background. Um, what do you have come up real soon? Uh, you have some Owen Wilson stuff coming up soon yeah i was the b camera operator uh for a few days on this uh owen wilson movie called paint uh where he plays a, a bob ross inspired character at a pbs station in, uh in vermont i'm actually not sure if i'm supposed to say that uh, <laughs> so here here we go uh this is on imdb so uh uh, Carl Nargol, a local treasure with a soothing whisper of a voice, has been hosting his own painting show on Vermont Public Television for decades. His Dr. art Dr. Rick McAdams. Uh, yes. Uh, his art captivates and has attracted the attention of many women over the years, especially those uh, who work at the station. But Carl is in a rut and the station isn't pulling in ratings. When a new painter is hired to revitalize the channel, Carl's own fears regarding his talents as a painter are brought to the forefront. So yeah, so I was a camera up on that. Uh, there's also a movie at Sundance right now called Resurrection uh, with Rebecca Hall. It's, I, I was the behind the scenes DP uh, for this movie. It's a horror movie, kind of slow burn. And the synopsis is... Margaret's life is in order. She is capable, disciplined, and successful. Everything is under control. That is until David returns, carrying with him the horrors of Margaret's past. And mm -hmm. also, so that's also got Tim Roth in it. So they were both fun to work with. Uh, you might know Tim Roth from Pulp Fiction, among other things. Um, so that's at Sundance right now. I'm also about to juror for Slam Dance. Um, so I was a programmer for Slam Dance. That's very this cool. Week. Yeah, and um, so I had a hand in, in selecting the films for the their unstoppable block of films, which are uh, disability oriented films about disability, and we are uh, about to uh, juror for the competition. So basically, had a it was really cool to go from being a filmmaker, you know, with my short film the co-op, which got in, and then Slam Dance is such a cool festival that they once you get in as a filmmaker, you're allowed to program, which I think is a really fantastic fantastic model it creates a family kind of environment 
um, which is what you want from a film festival. Um, and, you know, if you're like interested in film, but you, you know, you don't have like, don't know where you would start and you're not going to college for it or, or you're considering it, but maybe it's too expensive. I would say like the next best way would be to uh, make short films and then, you know, listen and look at what has worked for other short films of the genre that you're making. And then like what festivals did those films get into and then submit to those festivals and that can start to help you build connections. So for me, firsthand got that experience with slam dance uh which has been great um it's kind of definitely helped me grow as a filmmaker and expand uh my horizons and then um what you can watch currently uh there's a show cat people that's on netflix right now um, that i was the dp for two episodes yeah i think it's eight episodes in total so if you like cats uh ch check that out <laughs> <laughs> i'm a big cat person i have three uh, cats i'm a i'm a bit of a dog person myself but, uh... <laughs> and then there's an nbc show called american song contest that i gaffed recently that i think is in its first season and that's coming out soon and then obviously like yeah all the movies and tv shows i've worked on if you go to my imdb uh, you can check those out like iron fist molly's game which was Aaron Sorkin's directorial debut. I, I have so many <laughs> questions about that for the next episode of whatever episode we talk about it. Uh, that's what I was talking about was uh, we were saying how um, I think this should be broken up into two episodes for the podcast because sure. I, I, there's so much shit. I have questions about that. I mean, I just want to know whether or not you saw him in a chair with headphones on, like, you know, things, oh, yeah. you know, I'm, 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 you know, a typical director question. I just want right. to know that because, oh God, I, I do love Sorkin so much. Yeah. But, but um, okay. yeah, if you want to, if you wanted to stay updated with that stuff, uh, you can't wait for the next episode. Um, best place to probably stay up to date is on Instagram. I posted that the most and my handle is Cameron S dot Mitchell um usually post there like i don't even update my reel more than like once every two years i don't <laughs> update my imdb maybe once every six months but i will post daily to instagram <laughs> so uh if you're interested in you know seeing the stuff i'm working on that's where i would check me out awesome all right well cameron thank you i appreciate it man it, it was it was I, I i love talking to you um i think likewise uh, yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we, we, we will do this again, but <clears throat> to go through the list of things that I have to talk about contractually for Nerdthusiast, nerdthusiast.com. Uh, there are plenty of blogs and everything that go up. Also check out the social medias of Instagram and uh, Facebook and uh, I, Cameron, I don't know if you're on truth, but uh, we'll, we'll see whether or not we are. I, I, I know, I know. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Not on uh, I, 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 I'm just I'm just trying to get somebody upset at us actually that's really what I'm trying to do is just get somebody really pissed off this way maybe it blows up but I don't think it's gonna happen <laughs> um uh otherwise um not important enough <laughs> exactly you know <laughs> um but no, uh, no, thank you very much for, for, for hanging out with us. And also anybody uh, uh, on YouTube and on uh, uh, Spotify, we're on Spotify and the uh, Apple podcast. So uh, thank you very much for tuning in. I'm Dane, this is Cameron. Say goodbye, Cameron. Hey, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Hopefully I didn't bore you to death. <laughs> not at all, not at all. He'll be back and if he bored you, don't watch the rest of the next one. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Check out nerdthusiast.com. Thanks.